Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this joint colloquium of the Department of Physics and Astronomy and the Department of Teaching, Learning, and Teacher Education. I want to thank Beth Lewis for helping me set this up and especially welcome those of you from other departments and other institutions. We are in a Zoom webinar today, so we are reserving chat for solving technical issues, but questions may be submitted through the Q&A feature as they occur to you. And I will collate them at the end of the presentation and pitch them to Gay, to Gay as time allows. Okay. Our guest today is Gay Stewart from West Virginia University. She did her undergrad work at the University of Arizona and her PhD at the University of Illinois, where her dissertation was entitled A Search for CP Violation in D Maison Decays. Gay spent most of her career at the University of Arkansas, where she co directed one of the first PhysTech sites and oversaw a huge rise in the number of certified physics teachers graduating. She also led the Arkansas effort to replicate the UTeach program and continued the replication effort as she moved to West Virginia in 2014, where she leads the WVU Center for Excellence in STEM Education. Gay was the winner of the AAPT's 2019 Orsted Medal. This prestigious medal recognizes her outstanding, widespread, and lasting impact on the teaching of physics through her pioneering national leadership in physics education and her mentoring of students and in-service teachers. She will be talking to us today on the profession of teaching. Uh, please send a warm telepathic welcome to Gay Stewart. Hey, I'm trying to see if I can feel him. I don't think everybody took you serious, Kevin. Um, so today I wanna to talk to you uh, about obviously teaching and just briefly, you know, how does somebody go from annihilating electrons to preparing teachers? Uh, even in grad school, I saw very few students who even liked physics, including the physics major, uh, let alone people who loved it like I did. And I came to see that a lot of our K-12 students weren't getting the sort of educational experiences that lead them to consider or prepare for a STEM career. Um, you know, this is a, a major interest of the National Science Foundation, but more importantly, and you know, it's an issue of social justice. Um, so early in my career, I made the switch from annihilating electrons to trying to help prepare uh, physics majors. And I had some pretty good success recruiting physics majors and then teachers, um, but it was not something that we saw played out nationally, even with the Physics Teacher Education Coalition. And so I was really excited when this project, uh oh, let me go forward, um, came along. Um, the, the work I'm going to talk to you about today started out with a project team at, through an organization called 100K and 10 which uh, was looking to answer the call to produce 100,000 new STEM teachers in 10 years. And um, we, it, a partnership within 100K and 10 for this working group, we had four um, national uh, professional societies, a couple of universities were engaged, and we also had some nonprofit STEM teacher preparation programs. And the, the, the thing that came out of this partnership was an initial toolkit. Uh, the project team was led by Wendy Adams, and the toolkit was to address one of the primary issues impacting producing and retaining excellent math and science teachers uh, that our country needs, which are there are significant misperceptions out there about high school teaching uh, that discourage STEM undergraduates from exploring teaching as a viable career option. Um, growing out of this partnership is a grant that's funded by the National Science Foundation, and it involves the professional societies in physics, math, and chemistry. In each field, change agents have been chosen to help get the facts out, and I'm one of those. And um, so I want to share a little information with you about what this looks like and why you should and how you can get involved. The first thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a pre-survey and sign in to let us know that you're here. Because again, this is an NSF 
funded project and knowing who gets to see the materials will make NSF happy. But also this little pre quiz is going to uh, provide a roadmap of what we're going to be focusing on in the presentation. So if you would, has Kevin put the link in the Q&A so people can just click on it if they can't scan it? I'm sorry, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> okay, so. On my screen, it looks like I can just click on the slides, but I don't know if other people can do that. So I hope this is going to work. I just, uh, oh, somebody else had already done it for me that types faster than I do. Thank you. Oh, the link's not working. Links disabled. This is They are posted in responses now. Okay. And people are able to get on them? Okay. All right. Somebody said the link worked for them. Sorry, we knew there was going to be something squirrely happen in our virtual conference. Thank you for bearing with us. I think we'll Oh, Stephanie made it. Okay. Has everybody found their way to the the links? Oh, I hate not being able to see people.
Is there, how do we figure out if they've found the links and they're done? Okay. Um, yes, so if you reach the stop here, then when we get to the end, you'll just be able to keep going instead of having to find the link again. Um, so I know Christian made it there. Um, okay. Um, I guess Emily asked us to put up a poll. I'm not sure what she, is that to find out who has finished? I think maybe since I know we've got some people done, I should go ahead because I don't want people to get bored. Um, what do you think? Please proceed. Okay. Sorry for the, the craziness. Um, and we'll, we will see these links again towards the end. Um, so the first thing I'd like to do is have you sort of experience one of the resources that have come out of the Get the Facts Out project. It's our faculty staff presentation, so you can get a feel for how it works. Uh, normally, we'd present this uh, to faculty and staff at our institution with salary and retirement data for your location in the slides. And um, we start the faculty presentation with this message. Um, we ask participants to rate their lives. While we encourage them to discuss the question, we ask them to keep their answers private because many do find this question personal, so they prefer not to share their answer. But the, you know, on what step of the ladder would you feel you personally, would you say you personally feel you stand at this time on a scale of um, zero to 10? So just think about that. Um, this was given in a national survey to over 170,000 US workers. Um, to analyze it, they broke the ladder into three parts. Uh, note that the top is a smaller section than the bottom, just two or three of the possible responses. Sorry, four of the possible, three for one of them. Um, they did this sort of less than straightforward analysis where they took the percentage of respondents at the top and then they, which was some sort of weighted average of question one and two, and then they subtracted off the percentage of people who rated themselves at the bottom and they ignored basically anybody who fell in the middle. The results of this analysis showed uh, when they bin these scores by occupation group, that teachers in the United States rate their lives better than all other occupation groups trailing only physicians. Okay, now I know I just said a whole lot of words. It seems like maybe I could have said that shorter, but one of the things we do in this project is we carefully test messaging because kids don't always hear what we think they do. Uh, people don't necessarily respond the way you would expect them to. Something that sounds great to me as a physicist might not play well with somebody else. So these messages have all been tested that are available at the, in the Get the Facts Out material. And this particular way of saying this was the way that rated the, the strongest. Um, we look a lot at teacher well-being, and you know that, that last slide uh, shows that maybe you know there's some, and we'll look a little bit at work-life balance. Um, student colleague relationships and financial stability. And normally if I was doing a workshop, I would have asked you to generate some of these ideas, uh, but I'm just cutting to the punchline so we have time to see the resources. 
and we're going to walk through the facts in the way we found them most powerful to present. So when we ask science and math teachers what provides you with day-to-day -day satisfaction, um, there were some the biggest thing was really strong relationships between fellow teachers and um, students. The um, comments like, you know, strong relationships between fellow teachers committed to making amazing coworkers and friends, always learning new and emerging areas of content, science, teaching as a science. Um, teaching provides drive and reason to explore new and challenging areas of content. I didn't put the physics specific thing in here because it always makes our, our other colleagues mad, but the American Institute of Physics did a study and what they found was that um, teachers actually claim to use their physics more than most people who get a degree in physics then go out and get a job that isn't um, a research faculty member. So, um, you know, some of the things that make teachers happy on a day to day basis. And we know that finances are a, a concern. Um, so we are going to do a poll now. Um, the thing I'd like to ask you is just to get an estimate for how people feel. What's the closest to the typical uh, salary for K-12 teachers near your institution? Okay. Let's see. All right. That's... Okay. All righty. I'm. So everybody's had a chance to see that. I'm gonna. Oops. Go on to the next slide and ask you what you think teachers make 15 years into their career. Okay. All righty. So now that we've gotten the, you know, and we're kind of spread out all over the place, I think I maybe have a little more knowledgeable group than usual. But I did the, um, let's see, okay. look things up. And, um, Teacher salaries, nine month contracts, um, looked at a couple Lincoln and then someplace near Lincoln and then someplace else. Um, now these are the base salaries and for nine month contracts and you know, coaching can add a significant chunk to somebody's pay and school club sponsors can add um, a little bit to a pretty decent amount. Um, and you know, I can I can give you a link where you can look up everything nearby. It's always good to know where where your kids actually, and that's the thing I don't know where where your students would be most likely to want to go teach. But I tried to make some guesses, and we also present it with an annualized figure. Right, this is what you make in nine months if you actually got worked for twelve months, getting paid at that rate. What would your salary be? And those are just on the base salaries. The um, interesting thing comes when you, you look at 15 years. Um, not everybody makes the, the same, um, different school districts have different, different criteria. And one of the things we often hear is, okay, so these are some of the school districts that pay a little better maybe, except for Lincoln, I guess, because everybody wants to be there. Um, but I looked in Beatrice School District in Gage County, 
and their 15 year salary was less than 70,000. But the thing we find often is when a school district does pay less, the, the cost of living is also less. So home prices were considerably less there. And the, the other thing is that the per capita income um, is often, um, let's say not better than, than what teachers make in, and that's true in, in most states. The, um, the other thing is we often have students wander in and they tell us that they're interested in teaching and they're not sure at what level. And um, I wanna prefix this because these are salaries for permanent teaching faculty, not tenure track faculty. Because a, a 2016 study showed that as of 2016, 73% of faculty are not on the tenure track and that that was a trend that was continuing. Tenure track was going down compared to non-tenure track. Um, so we show the, the starting salaries and then the salaries 15 years out for um, faculty at different kinds of institutions. And again, at the PhD granting institution, these are teaching full-time teaching faculty, not instructors. Um, and these are the base salaries without any supplemental pay for the teachers. A couple things to keep in mind, your beginning K through or seven through 12 teacher are typically between 22 and 24 years old. Whereas that um, college faculty member is 27 to 30 and the fifth data 15 years out is before 40 versus mid forties. These college salaries are national averages from the AIP salary calculator. Um, and the seven through 12 data is an average from our data collection of 120 school districts located around the 50 universities that are currently working with Get the Facts Out. Um, if you look at the graph, you'll see the beginning years, secondary teachers and teaching faculty at colleges make similar salaries, but at year 15, um, the middle and high school teachers uh, tend to make more and they also got to start sooner. So um, according to what your goals are, you know, teaching um, seven through 12 is, uh, is financially equivalent or better than college teaching. The thing is, if you know, if what somebody really wants to do is teach, the the tenure track who do make more after 15 years um, have a different job description that might not appeal to all of our students. So if we looked, if you look into this more deeply and you think about the path to becoming a college faculty member, which is of course what most physicists know because we're college faculty members. Um, when you consider how much time it takes to get the permanent job, the um, time to advance degrees, relocation, job availability, you know, the scary tenure process, um, you know, there are some things that are, are a little different in pursuing the two careers. When you consider just careers in general, um, there are, this is a a graph of the typical salaries of bachelor degree recipients for the class of 2018. And, you know, yeah, physicists are the fourth one down. They tend to do a little better uh, than some other fields, but the teaching bar, the orange one here in the middle is not that different. And it is in fact, just a nine month instead of a 12 month salary. This is the 25th to 75th percentile uh, from the data mining project of those 120 districts. And on the high end, now the low end is the low end. The high end does include assuming that they're um, supervising a club or something. A lot, of them, a lot of them that responded were doing some of that stuff. Um, here's another tested statement. There are student loan forgiveness programs and scholarships for math and science teachers. Uh, for instance, there's a federal loan forgiveness program for $17,500, which is the direct. Um, 
that does require five years of consecutive teaching in a low income school. There was a program, the Perkins program, uh, which was really cool. Unfortunately, they're no longer available to new teachers, but we do have teachers out there who are teaching it out and they got a percentage of their student loans uh, um, forgiven after each year up to 100% if they taught for five years. Uh, many institutions now have NOICE grants or other scholarship programs to support future math and science teachers, which sort of takes over for this. Um, there are TEACH grants, federally funded grants for anyone eligible for federal loans and enrolled in a teacher prep program. And it's free money if you teach for four years within eight years of graduating from your program if you teach in a low income school. If you don't do that, then it becomes a student loan that you have to pay back. And there's lots more information on federal student aid that students sometimes tend not to know. Um, another tested statement. Uh, most teaching jobs have better retirement benefits than other jobs you can get with the same degree. And there's some various data to back that up. Uh, teachers tend to retire uh, a little earlier than average for other occupations. Um, I didn't get the information for Nebraska calculated, but I'll explain to you the differences. Um, Colorado uh, is a, um, if you start at 22 years old, you would hit full retirement at 57, which would be 87 and percent of your highest annual income. And um, we actually have a calculator for yearly annuity values of things like that. What somebody who is an in industry would have to be investing in their um, 401k in order to, to get that same return. Um, there's a, a bitly here that takes you to a spreadsheet that goes, has the data for retirement programs for all the states. For Nebraska, um, they also, they get their social security uh, as well as their retirement. It's a little more complicated set of rules. So if you're 55 uh, and uh, you can retire if, but it's retirement plus years of service equals 85. Um, you get two times, two percentage points times your years of service times the average of your highest three years of salary. If you retire before 65 though, they take some of that off. And there's a, a cost of living increase that's tied to the consumer price index, but limited to 2.5% per year. So it's decent retirement. Uh, okay, next poll. Um, teacher retention is another thing we hear uh, a lot about. So what fraction of grades seven through 12 teachers are still in the profession at year five? Okay, so I have pretty, pretty big spread again. Um, and the answer is actually 78%. The only field with higher career, the only higher career area retention is in the health professions. Uh, others, including engineering, have a higher rate of career change, especially the humanities fields. If we think back to that life evaluation index, it makes sense that this number is so high. Um, another thing is uh, content flexibility. So if you think about uh, curriculum standards, we all know schools have to teach to standards. If we actually look at those standards, um, we see that there are um, well, I'm just going to let you read this for a minute. And I guess the, the point I want to make is that, um, and these are for the, the next generation science standards, um, which, and the common core math, and 
you know, there aren't, there's not a national standards, but many states have based their standards on these things. So they look similar and you see there's a lot of um, actually kind of flexibility there for how you might cover that. Um, so, you know, the standards, at least to me, don't appear to provide very restrictive instructions about when, what, or how a teacher teaches. Um, the teachers do have the, the flexibility in how they teach. The standards outline the content that should be included in a course, do not mandate how that content will be um, taught or even in what order. And the standards are minimum knowledge. So, you know, creative teachers can build interesting things around those. Um, some districts do have pacing guides. Um, so yes, that's everybody, yes, yes. It'll be bad. Um, now, physics, chemistry, calculus, courses like that, that a lot of our graduates end up teaching uh, don't necessarily have the same sort of standards uh, and, um, or, but they, I mean, they're not part of the next gen or the common core, but they come out, of, they're usually taken from something that looks more like an AP standard. And those are very similar. So, while you're all thinking, what do, how flexible really are teachers? I wanna give you another chance to interact with a poll. What fraction of teachers report having at least some control over content, topic, and skills to be taught? This might be the important measure is what do our educators really think? Okay, and I'm going to show you the results once once I get your answers. And it's taken from a 2017 Educator Quality of Work Life Survey. Okay, not too bad. Pretty good distribution. And when we asked 5,000 teachers, um, the answer we got was 90%. Uh, well, actually, it was 89. I rounded. Setting content, topics, and skills to be taught, 89% uh, uh, said they had at least some control. Another piece of that, and there's actually the, the poll. Um, what fraction of teachers report having at least some control over selecting teaching techniques? And we have a poll for you. Maybe. Do you want the the agency one? Yes, please. Yeah, I tended to put them in pairs. Sorry. Okay. All right, so maybe you, you guessed based on the last one, but still a pretty good distribution of answers. And when we asked, this was asked on that same poll and 96% rounded again, uh, said they had at least some control um, in selecting the teaching techniques, 98% uh, thought they had at least some control in evaluating and grading students, 93% disciplining students, 96% determining the amount of homework to be assigned. Of course, with that last one, we know with the, the COVID-19, you know, some of those answers might be different as schools have gone to sort of emergency procedures to cope with online learning in some places. But, you know, on a, a normal year, teachers do seem to feel they have a lot of control over how they how they teach their courses. Another um, item that is interesting is respect. And so here I'm going to I'm going to mention a couple of categories, but what fraction of teachers think they're respected by their students and parents? Mm 
Okay. I think someone sussed me out. All right. So if we look, yes, 87% students, 88% of parents. Now it, it kind of 95% of their coworkers. When we start looking further afield, here's where we find a lot of the, um, and where if you think about it, where a lot of the negative messaging comes from, local and national media. 39%. So uh, that's one of the reasons we're trying to change the, the conversation um, to make it closer to reality. So we have this severe shortage of physics, chemistry, and math teachers, which was the motivation for the Get the Facts Out project. Um, so at this point, I think maybe the horrible shortage is just because you know, kids aren't interested in becoming teachers. But then we actually asked math and science, or actually math, computer science, chemistry, physics majors, um, you know, if they had any interest in becoming a teacher. So one more poll. What fraction of students do we think are probably interested in becoming teachers? I think there are people who just won't vote. All right, so we've got a pretty good distribution again with our largest being 10 to 25. We gave this poll and the, you know, what I've shown here, are the interested, uh, I left out the others. And if we look, the average here is pretty much between 40 and 50%. Physics is pretty close to 50, math a little bit more. If we left out computer science, things would look great. If we think back to the pay scale, they were the one group that um, were outperforming everybody else. So this was, uh, again, this was from a panel on public affairs report done by the American Physical Society, 6,000 STEM undergraduates across the United States. So the question is, what was going on? How could there be such a severe shortage of teachers when such a large fraction of majors in those disciplines are interested in the profession? And what we found is that most have perceptions of the profession that are not based on correct facts. And when these, I, when these facts are clarified for them, it opens the door to those with an interest in teaching so they can make a fair decision between the professional options. The idea is not to go out and convince anybody they want to become a teacher, just to let them make a, a fair decision and not talk them out of something they'd really like to try based on stuff that's not quite right. It was interesting in this, con in this um, report, they actually asked them how much they thought teachers made and how much they wanted to make uh, you know, to live happily ever after. And the number they wanted to make was closer to what teachers made than the number they thought teachers made, which was about $15,000 too low. Um, we've also asked a similar question in our own GFO research. And again, we come out with around 50% of students who are interested. Um, I think I won't dig into all the what all the codes mean, but interested, the 14.8%, you know, actually planning on teaching 39.3, and then the neutrals and the don't wants. Um, you know, everybody always tells me, oh, more and more kids are going through the alternative uh, non-traditional licensure, and that is true, but we see that it's not enough to make up for the dropping enrollments in our traditional programs. 
And the scary thing is because the media is so aggressive at pulling out the worst parts of being a teacher and talking about those like that's all of it, that for the first time ever in 2017, the number of parents who would like their child to become a teacher um, was there were more no's than yeses. Um, so this is, you know, a Gallup poll and it's kind of sad when you think about how much we depend on well-prepared students to make our lives happy at the university. So again, that's the motivation for this project. And the idea is to start celebrating the positives of the profession, not to continue to focus on the, the negatives. We found that was very important. And that message that teachers' well being is higher than all other occupation groups trailing only physicians is important. Now, I'm not going to stop to do the survey just yet. I want to show you what the materials are, and then I'll come back and let you guys do the survey while we're doing questions. I just want to take a couple minutes and show you around the stuff you can do it, get the facts out. So, there's, you'll find information that gives the summaries of teacher benefits, the kinds of things we've talked about. Uh, there are presentations to give with faculty and staff for students, uh, information on how to reach students, posters, brochures, and data handouts that you can customize to your institution along with instructions to help you do that, a template for a flyer, um, information on how to help you share your passion for teaching and assessments to see if you're actually impacting what your students understand and what your faculty understand about the profession. And our big audiences are faculty and advisors, students, peers, and parents, because faculty and advisors have such a huge influence on students. Um, the faculty presentation, there's a 15 minute version, there's a 50 minute version. Um, the thing I'm kind of doing here, which is hoping to recruit some new champions, can can be a way longer. I did. I'm not keeping you for four hours. Um, the student presentation is clicker-based questions, um, the, and we find that students are concerned with salaries, job satisfaction, and retirement. So you can imagine going through and letting them find these things out can help. Comes in various lengths. Um, we have um, some information support on how to reach students, creating a video to go to admissions, attending the be beginning of class, which I must admit we've been doing on Zoom lately, direct email works great, uh, student life events, the Office of Residence Life can get you in touch with kids, the Career Center, of course, student math and science associations, and the Alumni Association, and I'll you know, you can think about other options on your campus, which you know better than I do. Uh, here's some examples, the brochures, the poster, uh, the flyers. And so when I keep saying this word champion. A champion is somebody who shares the facts about teaching. And that sharing the facts includes having conversations, sharing a meme on Facebook, giving a workshop at a regional meeting, using any of these resources. Um, the critical features, if you look on our website, there's a critical features about sharing the facts. Um, the important ones, avoiding voicing misperceptions, because if you say the thing everybody already believes, then sometimes they don't hear it when you tell them what's true. And, um, you know, using tested messages, because again, sometimes we can say something we think will go very well, and it doesn't. There is a community. Um, you can register and earn points and get credit towards um, service, recognition via the newsletter and stuff to put on your CV. Uh, there's a Facebook group. I said, you know, posting memes can be helpful. You can come steal memes from the Facebook group to post. And you can also ask questions and talk to the researchers about the studies. And so we're now at the question part. I'm going to go back and open up the, tell you where the surveys are in case you've lost the link. And I'm happy to answer questions. I 
wanted to leave 15 minutes, I didn't quite make it. If you and don't have questions, I'll talk more. Please go ahead and uh, submit questions through the Q&A line. I guess I have one to start for you, Gay. Um, mm -hmm. Whenever I see the statistics about which institutions are creating, creating may not be the best word here, but the large numbers of credentialed physics mm -hmm. teachers, it seems like there's some real success stories and then a very large number of places where there's one or two, if, if any. Right. And what do you attribute that great difference to? Is it because institutions are not trying because they're not good at it? I mean, what is your... Well, there, there are some, some scary things that happen, right? If the physics department, you know, somebody shows up and says they're interested in teaching and the physics advisor just sends them off to go talk to somebody in education to figure it out, they've pretty much just told that student that they don't value that career. So most places where there is a successful physics teacher preparation, there is somebody that we think of as a champion. That word actually came up in phys tech before it came up and get the facts out. Somebody who bothers to find out a little bit about what it takes to become a teacher uh, among the advisors and could actually you know, help students um, navigate that. Sometimes the problem is over on the other side. Um, you know, uh, you you aren't necessarily going to have a huge number of future physics teachers right away, and sometimes programs in colleges of education can can feel like they have things that aren't really helpful for the physics teacher because they're so general, uh, and which can leave students uh, feeling a little lost. The, the big program or problem we had at Arkansas was originally it was a five year program. You had to do a fifth year or a one year master's after you completed your degree. But because of the prereqs, it often ended up being, you know, a six year program for physics majors. And, um, you know, having to go to school for another two years to not make more money than you could make right now was not something kids could necessarily sell to their loved ones even if it's what they really wanted to do. There is another project at the American Physical Society and AAPT, uh, the best practices um, or effective practices in undergraduate physics programs, which will be launching in January and has a chapter on teacher preparation programs with a lot of this advice in it. Here's but, a, a tough question for you. Uh oh, okay. Isn't some degree of control over how they teach a content a fairly low standard for saying that teachers are satisfied with how they are allowed to teach? Um, that was just one of the things we had a measure of. That is a pretty <clears throat> low standard, although when you ask people why they think teachers wouldn't enjoy their job, that's usually the first thing they say. Um, but more importantly, it was you know, I mean, if you look, they, they are, um, they're very happy with their lives. And, you know, we, the, um, so that was just one of the things we could measure. Uh, Beth Lewis has shared some information about her two um, NSF NOICE grants. Yay. Um, the second of which just ended and they've been able to recruit 90, um, I'm sorry, recruit future teachers at the MA level and we're able to support 90 uh, pre-service teachers. So let me share that link with the, uh, yeah. the group. That's awesome. Other questions, folks? Uh, and I must have, I should have pulled in some more of the uh, information from the POPA report since we had mostly physicists here. Um, the sorts of things that people think aren't going to be good are not the things they find that are um, teachers are enjoying themselves for the most part. Let me, let me just put it that way. Um, there are some things that people don't like about their jobs. I don't know that there are many more things than I don't like about my job. Um, it just depends on, you know, what you love to do. What is a good career? For some of our kids, it's high school teaching. For some of our kids, it might be a faculty position. 
for some of our kids, it might be industry, whatever makes them happy and fulfilled. We did find in an interview with our, we put our industry folks and our teachers in the same room and the teachers realized that they had a much easier time scheduling vacations. They had much more flexibility to spend time with their children. They had, um, they didn't have to change jobs to get raises. Um, they didn't have to up and move as, you know. So there were, there were a lot of things that just the whole work-life balance um, seemed very positive. Okay. I'll shut up and let you get a question edgewise, if there, there are any. There aren't any in the queue right now. <sighs> okay. So the, the idea here, if, um, you know, if anybody would like to be a champion, there are many things we can do to help support you in that process. And as one of the change agents, you know, I could serve as a mentor to help you as you figure out how to use these materials. Um, and uh, we do have another question now. Yay. Okay. What are you doing to recruit underrepresented teachers? So, um, of course, Part of the problem is you primarily, you know, you're recruiting from your undergraduate population. We are working with some schools to look at getting the facts out at area high schools and where there might be uh, a broader representation. There is a project, you mentioned you teach, so I'll, I'll, I'll people know I'm affiliated. There is a, a project right now to bring in a significant number of uh, HBCUs into the UTeach family and the decision on the part of the funder is that they will have to be using the get the facts out materials. So we're hoping to see significant recruitment um, in those institutions. We know that a lot of teachers tend to work near where they went to college. So for instance, when Texas closed a bunch of small physics programs, what they ended up doing was cutting off pipelines of, um, you know, a more diverse teacher pool. And there have been some decisions made on the uh, requirements for entering a teacher preparation program. If you look at an early college GPA as a primary cut point for whether or not somebody can be a teacher, you tend to disadvantage students who came from disadvantaged high schools and you, um, you reduce your minority candidates much more than your um, not marginalized candidates. So trying to understand our policies so that we don't do things that sound great but disadvantage groups of students and trying to get this message out to students is what we're up to. We are getting more questions now. Um, another tough one here. How would you oh. compare K through 12 teaching to tenure track faculty member at a research university? So if you love writing grant proposals and doing research in the lab, then you should be a tenure track faculty member. If what gets you out, out of bed in the morning is seeing that light bulb go off in, in a student's eyes and really feeling like you're changing a lot of lives, maybe high school teaching would be way more satisfactory. And I've had some students do, you know, kind of both. I've had kids who decided they wanted to go teach for four years and then go to graduate school and become a faculty member and I did have one student who did that and then turned around and went back to high school. Um, you know, the, the others who've done it, it hasn't been long enough. <laughs> we'll see. I think some of them are gonna be great college faculty. Um, but it's, it is your personal motivation. I mean, there are a lot of people that look at what tenure track faculty do and go, oh my God, how can you live like that? Um, so hopefully that was a politically fair answer. 
here's an observation that has come in. It's kind of emphasizing the importance uh, to tell prospective physics teachers that they need to show kids the cool physics the first time. You have any That's comment to that? Yeah, just I was waiting for for Tim to say something cool. Um, yeah, I mean, if you the the comments teachers make about what they get to do, you know, getting kids excited about science, being able to, you know, and then the kid that asks the question and oh my God, you've got to go dig up something to figure it out. Um, it's uh, it's pretty exciting, and some people that's you know way more fun than writing grant proposals. Here's a second interesting observation. Both classroom teaching and research are and can be satisfying and both involve turning on light bulbs. Absolutely. It depends on which light bulb makes you happier, which career is better for you. I mean, we do have faculty that decide that they, I mean, I, at our institution, that they are not interested in the, the research load and they become teaching faculty. And, you know, I mean, they could have made that decision, um, you know, it would have been financially beneficial to make that decision towards, towards high school teaching much earlier. You talked earlier a lot about the HBCU effort. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything going on as far as Indian reservations or anything like that? That is not, um, that is not something we have taken on yet. We are trying to recruit an institution that works more with that population. Um, you know, right now we sort of, we have our, our network of institutions that have, have committed and we are, you know, actively trying to recruit more institutions. We'll help them do it and they'll help broaden that pool. Um, yeah, I know I had one Native American um, high school physics teacher in my entire time at Arkansas that we produced. Of course, that was kind of similar to the percentage of Native Americans at the campus. But uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tough question. We need more institutions that, that serve more students and, or are places where they have access. Because it's hard to, you know, of course, now it's getting easier with Zoom, but to get to places to talk to people. Oh, oh uh, there are pre-service teachers on the line right now. Awesome. Um, I don't know what I can I can do to help with this. Just let me know. This is one of the. Um, I mean, I have now advised a lot of teachers, and they are amazing. And, you know, a lot of, I fill out my noise reports and I have a lot of teachers that are still teaching well after they have to and can't imagine doing anything else. Um, there's been some grumblings during COVID-19, but they still said they wouldn't do anything else. So Gay, we have reached five o'clock and All right. the question queue is empty. Okay. Let me just make sure everybody, I mean, if any of those pre-service teachers want to email me and say hi, uh, gay.stuart at mail.wvu.edu um, and welcome to the family. And uh, thank you all so much. Thank you for coming, Gay. Um, more telepathic thank yous, please. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.